Hello. Hey there. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, to our 13th meetup. We decided to celebrate uh, the first day of fall with a very special guest. But before, let me share with you some, uh, let me share some news, some great news, and a, a bit about ourselves. So we were able to continue these online events uh, thanks to Fidzai, uh, our sponsor. So we are very grateful for that. Uh, for the ones that are here for the first time, my name is Sara Mshkita, and together with my friend Koru, we decided to create Data Visualization Lisboa. Uh, the idea was to promote a local data viz community in Portugal and bring together everyone that wants to transform raw data into fascinating visualizations. Um, and a fun fact, we met at um, InfoPlus uh, 2018, where Maurice Stefaner gave uh, a presentation about peak spotting uh, that managed uh, passengers' uh, train loads in Germany, and it blew my mind. So please go. <laughs> yeah, so as Sarah already mentioned, uh, Moritz studied as me, like this is actually what we have in common in Germany, in Potsdam, where even the conference takes place. And not only there, he is a pioneer and mentor for many students, even better is even that he's regularly come by and share his knowledge with the students. To all other enthusiasts, he offers with his Data Stories podcast together with Enrico Bettini and enriching our listening and great sources and inspiration for their own work. As a truth and beauty operator, a title I am really jealous of, he keeps chasing the perfect shape for information. With a background in cognitive science and interface design, his work beautifully balances analytical and aesthetic aspects and mapping complex phenomena to support data-driven decision-making. In the past, Moritz has helped well-known clients to find insights and beauty in large data sets. He is uh, the record winner of the Contour Information's Beautiful Award, and his work has been exhibited at many places already. Moritz Stefana continues to excite more and more people about the magic that can emerge when art and science, science connect deeply. So, hello and welcome, Moritz, and thank you for being here with us today and sharing some of your magic with us. <laughs> Thanks so much for the kind introduction. It's great to be in Lisbon, at least virtually. <laughs> and yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to uh, share a bit of process insights with you today. Great. So the stage is yours and I will let you talk. Wonderful. And here are the slides. Yeah, finding truth and beauty in data. That's sort of my job. And uh, uh, yeah, truth and beauty operator is my official job title I gave myself. And you know what? It's a process. So it's not always easy. And um, I, I like to use these talks to also reflect a bit on how a good data visualization process looks like and what worked and what didn't work in the past and maybe share a few tricks with you um, along the way. Uh, just in terms of introductions, a couple of recent projects I've been working on. So I've teamed up with Salesforce, UX, R&D, and we looked at can we analyze design and can we teach machine, machines to design? So I helped with data visualization on, for instance, color palettes or typographic patterns and so on. Um, I recently completed a project for Scientific American where we looked at the structure of the language of the magazine across 175 years of publishing. So that, that has been uh, an amazing data set to work with. And uh, last year uh, with Lena Klaus, a friend of mine, and Sky Murray, also a very talented data uh, visualizer, I teamed up to create a, um, a plastic beach sculpture in Bali showing the fate of all plastic ever produced. So you can see already uh, there's quite a range of types of projects I do from very applied and very practical stuff to also a bit like pushing the envelope a bit in data art and experiments. One project uh, that Sarah already mentioned and that we might come back to today a couple of times is the Peak Spotting Project. It's a, a passenger load management tool for the German railway. They use it internally and it's a very like specifically crafted interface, uh, a tool that helps people really deal with huge amounts of data and make it actionable and make sense out of it. And 
Um, Dataviz is a team sport, and this one, this project especially, so uh, a lot of credit goes here also to Studio Nant, Christian Au, and also Christian Lesser. And so many of the slides you'll see today, um, these folks will have had a hand in it in some way or the other. So uh, just to mention that. Um, yeah, so when people ask me what I do, I usually say not making better charts, but I say crafting data experiences because I think data visualization is about much more than just making better charts. It's of course, it starts there and that's like the, the alpha and omega. But at the same time, I'm really interested in creating rich visual languages and creating interfaces that are really tied to a purpose and really crafted on point for a specific situation or a specific topic. And also today, when I talk about the process, I will mostly argue from a point or the position of a freelance designer where I am, so <laughs> it's my personal like perspective, who works with clients on fairly applied projects, so mostly tools, so maybe less the data art projects or the totally experimental stuff. Um, on the other hand, if you work on uh, these types of projects or more communication type projects, I think a lot of the general principles will still like transfer, but keep in mind anything I say is today more focused on this crafting really focused tools in, a, in an applied context. So let's dive right in. Um, how do we do it? How does it work? Um, how, how does creating really successful data visualizations work? How does good design work in general? Turns out um, when you zoom out quite uh, far enough, <laughs> it's actually quite simple. As Tim Brennan pointed out already in 1990, and he made this like sort of yeah, fun diagram which, uh, and, and comments it with like, if somebody comes up for a project, we do some stuff and the money follows. And uh, I, I found this a really fun uh, depiction of the design process as many outsiders see it obviously, but you know, it still remains a black box and it's sort of maybe even um, sort of mystifying design as this like, oh, some magic happens and nobody can tell how it works. Um, um, other folks try to uh, maybe characterize the nature of design or successful design a bit more metaphorically, like how does the design process looks, look like? Well, you go from a mess to something really clearly shaped and something orderly and beautiful, right? And of course it's nice if that works out, but it doesn't really help you how to do that, right? It's more a depiction of a successful design, but it doesn't tell you how it works. It's a bit almost like this, uh, how to draw an owl. Um, sketch that many of you might be familiar with. You just draw some circles, then draw the rest of the fucking hole, right? Um, so these types of things, I think they're philosophically interesting, but obviously they're not that helpful if you want to learn how to design uh, successful data visualizations. Um, here's another fun one I found uh, through Marcin Ignaz from Variable.io, very talented designer as well. And uh, he made this Twitter post where he said like, oh, look, this is how I think all designers envision the dream design process and often how it's also presented if we're honest, right? You start with a sketch. First you thought it would be a pear, but then it turns out it should be an apple and you make a better apple and then you fill in the colors and at the end the lighting and everything's cool. Um, and you look at these processes and you're like, yeah, that's how it should work. But then you also wonder like, well, if it's that easy, why does do the project that I end up in always look like more like that bottom row, right? And become that huge mess of different conflicting solutions and a big jumping around of back and forth. And honestly, it's still the same for me, really by far none of the projects I work on work ideal. There's always something you could improve on the process and many have fundamental process flaws. So it's really worthwhile to consider why, why, why is it always like that, right? And I found that interesting. And we talk about the ideal process so much, but I thought like, okay, how, if you were to set out to ruin a data visualization project, how would you do it, right? It's like, let's say you're the saboteur or the mole, right? Like how, how would you sab sabotage any data visualization project? And uh, I came up with this list. So I think first it's important that you have no idea who your users are or your audience is, right? So either totally clueless in that regard, or you have, that's even better actually, you have five different user groups. They all have totally different needs. They're all contradicting needs and they're all equally important. That's great. Um, next trick is you don't tell the designer, you know, you keep all that information secret and you just like, you know, let that trickle out in different phases of the project. Um, you keep moving the goalposts. So whenever you reach a, a point in the project where you think you're done, you know, the goal has already shifted. 
Um, it's also important to really debate every single design detail in the full committee. Like everybody should have an opinion on the color of a button. Um, of course, you have the right to revoke any prior decision at any time in the project, otherwise it would be easy. And of course, the key is to bring in the data as late as possible. So, I mean, that sounds a bit mean because it sounds like we're shifting also the blame here towards the client, which is a fun thing that designers like to do. But actually, as designers, if things go like this, it's our fault because obviously we were not clear enough about like clarity of purpose of the project, clarity of the process, like how it should work. And that data, for instance, is really important to a data visualization project. So the ball is back in our court and we have to have a better process to start with and better clarity in communication about that process. So I'm trying to help you with that now. Um, the first thing I think, so I started with this question, how? And I think that one of the key points that I will come back to today really again and again is that we need to embed that how into a couple of other questions. So we think so much about how do I visualize a network? You know, how do I draw this data set? You know, how do I navigate from here to there in the application? But what we should actually start with is why does this application or this visualization exist in the first place? Should it exist at all? You know, is, is the world better with it or you know, without it? Um, so what's the purpose? Then if you know the purpose, you can talk more about what it should be in principle, like what, what type of genre or what type of media, right? And for whom are, are we building this? And if you don't have really crisp answers on all these questions, the how is really much harder um, to define. And basically then you run into the situation where you have no clear criterion why a certain how solution is better than the other one. And the more clarity you have on these first questions, the better things will turn out. The other thing, so you know why, what, for whom, you know the how, you build a nice visualization. The other thing you should really also reflect afterwards what happened and not just move on and you know go to the next gig, but there's no chance of improvement if you don't have a chance to reflect and sort of change things. And to me, this is really at the core of the process I'll present to you tomorrow. I have a more complicated version of that one too. And this one is really still work in progress. So I'm trying to rework my whole design process diagram. So it's considered more as a, as a work in progress. And in fact, I would really be interested in your feedback also later uh, in the Q&A on which part of that process makes sense to you or which ones could be improved. But like how a lot of my projects go um, is that we start with the why, the what, and the for whom. We really want to have a crisp understanding of like these questions. And um, in order to find that out, we start with a discovery phase. And that phase it ends with a concept that defines all these really important things. And also at the end of that phase, the project team has a really clear understanding of how the data looks like and what different perspectives on the data look like, and probably something like a key storyline or a sketch of an application that we could build. Like, some, what are the main views on that data that we will work with later? And if you have that, then you can enter, a, let's say, a traditional design phase. The whole process is designed. But here, this design phase is really more the narrow type of graphic or interaction design that you might be familiar with from other disciplines, not data visualization. So you have a fairly clear brief, you know your data, and then you can sort of flesh out the details and work uh, on the look and feel or the interaction, right? And this phase in my process does not end with a deck of screens or a PDF or something like this, but it usually ends with an interactive prototype because I think interactive applications need to be demonstrated in an interactive form. Once that is approved and we have agreement, yeah, that's the thing we're gonna build, then a production phase starts and um, there should be a phase where we stop adding stuff. That's the <laughs> feature freeze point. Uh, and once the final thing is built, uh, we can move into um, watching how people use it and assessing what worked, what didn't work and sort of uh, learn from the living thing in, in the wild, basically. So that's the, the big picture. And I'll try and walk you through all that today. It's a longer process uh, and we'll, we'll see how far we'll get. Um, but <laughs> this is basically how things work in a lot of my projects. Quick disclaimer, no single method can replace thinking on your feet and just you know understanding what's going on. And I always deviate from that plan in some way or the other, right? 
And uh, so the important really other task is you define your design process all the time anew. And that's also why I have so much trouble documenting it in this fixed form. So um, every project is different. So think of it more as like a box of ingredients you can use than, than a fixed recipe, if that makes sense at all. Anyways, so let's start. The client has a brief and, and we enter that discovery phase. Or you have a project idea. Maybe you are your own client, right? And you just have an idea, oh, we should visualize that data. Then you can treat yourself maybe as the client. It's a self-commissioned project, basically. So first thing in the discovery phase, or for the whole discovery phase, understand the objectives of the project, understand the data situation, and understand your audience or your users. And the, again, the better you define that, the easier the following phases will be. And so in the beginning when I did data visualization project and somebody came to me and said, we need a real time dashboard for our sales figures. It needs to be built in V3 and it needs to have these types of views and fills. We have figured all of that out. Yeah, can you build it? I was like, yeah, sure, let's, let's do it. You know, sounds great. And by now I always walk step back and dig a bit deeper and really look, ask people like, okay, cool, sounds great. Now, what are you hoping to achieve with this? Like, why is the spec the way it is? What other things have you tried? You know, how, how did you come up with this specific idea of how things look? Because here the client already describes the how, right? And I want to make sure the why and the for whom and the what, you know, fit that, that how. We might end up with the same thing than he had or, or she had a good intuition. Uh, but I just want to verify this how is the thing we should build. Um, Again, asking for um, audiences who would use this, what for, and can we talk to them? <laughs> and so like talking personally to, to end users or audiences is super key. Um, and the final thing is often, and that's also so important, is to ask to you, what constitutes success? Like why, well, like what would be the best outcome of this project for you? And also what constitutes failure? Like how could we mess this up? Like, or how would that look like, right? What, what would be the biggest thing we could get wrong? Yeah. And as a freelancer who might get paid, you know, on a, like a work contract, not for time, but for a product, it's also really important to understand when we are done because I later want to, you know, be done at some point. So getting a clear answer to when, when the project is finished is also a really, really good tip. Um, yeah, and so once you start that dialogue, a lot of things like follow up that immediately from that and more research or more questions. You don't need answers to all of these questions immediately, but you want to start that dialogue, right? The second thing is really getting in touch with the users. And here we see some of the, the power users we had at the German railway. You use lots of screens and it was really important to, to understand the tool landscape they use, the visual jargon they use, what types of visuals they're used to and what their pain points are. And for instance, we were supplied with this image of printed out Marais diagrams, really cool diagrams, you know, that show um, space on the horizontal axis and time on the vertical axis. People familiar with Tufti's books might have seen them. Um, and they love these diagrams and they work a lot with them and they, in, in times of need, even resorted to printing them out and, you know, marking like the, the most busiest connections of the day. And it was super interesting for us to see, okay, uh, they actually work with these type of advanced diagrams and the type of interactions they want to do. So in fact, we picked up that inspiration directly, built a prototype in Tableau that uses, as you can see in the middle, um, very similar form of display. And in the end, it made it into the final, you know, fully designed and fully crafted product. Like basically this very initial inspiration of something our users did directly. And I think that's sort of an ideal case of, you know, really taking directly like an inspiration from a user interview. And in other cases, you get more high level ideas or pain points, but it's just so important to talk with the people who use your, your product in the end. The other thing that is really, really important, I think, is to work with real data right from the start. So it's not just about understanding the texture and the scale and the completeness of the data to understand what are the constraints or what's the, like the sandbox you know, I'm playing in, but also I get inspired a lot by the structures I find in the data. And I think it's in data visualization projects also really important to take the data serious and not mistreat it or just use it for your own you know, goals but really ask what would the data want, right? And, uh, Martin Wattenberg famously said, 
you should treat data as another stakeholder in the project, like in addition to you and the client and the users, maybe data has rights too, and you know has a right to be represented in a good way. And if you want to do that, you really need to look at it from all different angles. And if you have maybe geographic trends over time, you want to split them up in different ways and see like, does it make more sense to focus on the time aspect or the space aspect or both in which situations and for me, it's always much easier if I do that with actual data, because I think insights or patterns cannot be simulated or mocked up. You have to see them and see if a certain chart delivers something or not, right? And so in this first discovery phase, even if I have visual ideas, like on the right-hand side, oh, it could be cool to have this like star-like representation. At the same time, I always verify these intuitions or ideas with, okay, how does the actual distribution of the data look like? You know, how would that play out? Because you can have the greatest ideas on paper if the data is very uniform or wildly, you know, varying, it might not look that great after all. And so just exploring data and sort of immersing myself in it is like really important um, part of the process in this early phase. I use uh, Tableau a lot for prototyping. But you could also use R or Python with pandas and, and whatever, uh, Altair um, processing, D3, uh, observable notebooks. So, but I think uh, you'll need, if you do data heavy projects, you'll need one environment where you can sort of quickly produce a lot of different charts of, of a given data set just to see the full spectrum of what's possible. And often these charts are really ugly and like, you know, really not that fancy or cool, but I just want to see what's, you know, what happens when I play with the data. And here we have a line chart of um, uh, labor markets, like um, how many like free positions are there for people seeking work in different countries, something I, I worked on for OECD. And I just played with it in Tableau and I was like, oh, that's kind of funny. It looks like a check mark maybe, or, or if something's bouncing, right? And so just, looking at the shape of these data sets can give you design ideas immediately. And so in this case, we were like, huh, you know, we could make the whole story around that. So job markets bounce back, you introduce like a visual metaphor and you reinforce that and bam, you have an, an interesting visual idea, right? And so I think that's sort of the ideal case when the data itself seems to suggest the design, you know, and you don't need to even come up with anything, but it's more, you find it and it's it's it was already there in the data, basically, the, the metaphor you could work with. Um, data, love-hate relationship. You should always be really suspicious also of data. So make sure to also doubt the data. Just don't take it as it is, but just assume something's fundamentally wrong with the data sets you receive and you work with because usually it is. And so make sure you catch all these like shortcomings and gaps and biases and mismeasurements in your data set as soon as possible. And, uh, and don't build like the whole project on a flawed data foundation, that would be sad. Um, yeah, and so this first phase, this is discovery phase is really a lot about finding the right angle. So I often compare it to photography. If you wanna have a really good portrait of a person, the key is to take a lot of shots and later select the right one. And in, in data visualization, it's very similar. Like the more different perspectives you can create really quickly and cheaply in a quick and dirty way, uh, the better you understand what are the recurring patterns, what are the really interesting structures and which visuals seem to like pique people's you know, interest. And um, so this phase to me is really a lot about listening, observing, understanding, being really receptive not inventing anything, but really being more receptive about what you can find in that new context or with these new data sets. Get your hands dirty, play with the data and see, see what you find. And ideally, if it goes well, you come out of this phase uh, with clear objectives, clear idea of audience, of the context of the project and a scope like that you can say, oh, later it will be this big or this complicated. You will have an understanding of what the data can do and what the data would want, right? Um, you have a good sense of the most important data perspectives or maybe the key stories if it's more a, a communicative project. And often like on the way, I collect ideas already about what's a good visual data language, like which basic building blocks might we be working with and what are good like visual metaphors. You sort of pick that up as you go along. It's not fleshed out yet, but you have a sense of it, right? And 
I think that's a great basis then to move into this proper, let's say, proper design phase um, that comes later. Um, like thinking about also contract situations and how you work with a client, um, it can be a great choice to say you first do the discovery and only after that discovery, you fix how big the actual later project is and how it, how it looks like in principle, right? Because only then you and the client have a really clear idea about the nature of a project. And often things are just fixed and set in stone before you even know what you're dealing with, which is always a bit risky. Uh, obviously, or maybe you just, yeah, th there could have been a better setup once you have completed that discovery phase. And sometimes it doesn't ha happen super often, but sometimes also for me it happens, we cancel the whole following project based on the discovery because we learned the client's objectives cannot even be met given the data or like other constraints. And again, you want to know that, want to know that early on. You don't want to tell them that like 80% into the project, but it's good if there is a fundamental mismatch to have a quick idea about that too, right? Um, yeah, so I think this phase is super important and really underrated often because you just think you know everything already. You just dive into design, but then it catches on later, you know, all the shortcomings that, that were there and you sort of glossed over them. Anyways, moving on with this diagram into the design phase. And um, here often the first step is really take all these little pieces and all these individual chart ideas and functionality ideas um, and see how they could be put together to make a meaningful whole, right? And so think about information architecture, uh, think about what are the main functional components I could build now this application out of and how will they play together? Like what do people see first? What can they do then? What happens then? Basically like a little like model of the whole application how it works. And the funny thing is this is when paper really <laughs> comes in for the first time, you know, in this presentation. And also like sketching on paper doesn't play this huge role for me in this discovery phase, but um, printing out stuff and doing stickies and sketches um, are to me very valuable in this information architecture phase when it comes to assembling sort of from all these, uh, like a bit like a scrapbook, basically all these different pieces, this this complete picture of how the, the application will look like. And, and I think also paper is great there to try out application ideas with, with users directly or your stakeholders. And so, yeah, that's actually the most paper heavy phase. Uh, the rest is all pretty digital. Um, and the wireframes, it really depends a lot on how detailed you want to be. It depends a lot on the complexity of the application. Sometimes I do just really simple stuff, like just to confirm with the client, okay, we'll just have three views. You know, there's a landing page, there's a big map, there's a panel <laughs> with an overview, you know, like just to make sure, okay, these are the things we're talking about. Other times it's much more elaborate and much more complicated also. So here there was a much more complicated application with lots of interaction. And we tried to describe all the interactions, but also the data sources and basically took these little pieces of, of charts we produced before. And the funny thing is also this diagram looked so, so scarily complicated already that people were like, ah, oh, I think the application is too complicated. And we then managed to boil it down to these three screens. So if you realize your own visualizations basically of your visualization um, are really hard to do. It makes you also rethink, you know, the application concept. And so that, that can be also really helpful. So if you have trouble like formulating even in a clear way how the thing would work, maybe it is too complex to build to start with. Um, peak spotting, we didn't do so much wireframing, but we had a really good general understanding. What are the main components of, of the application? And how do they play together? And I think that's the most important part in this phase to understand which user task is, is done where. And also if later new ideas come about what people should be able to do, you want to know where to put that in the application, right? So basically having this floor plan, let's say, of, of, the, of the house. Um, yeah, and if you have the basic, like the raw building, you can also look into interior <laughs> design basically and refine like the look and feel. Let's say, you know, you have sort of a heat map type thing going on or like values on a map. You know, there's like so many ways you can do that. And each of them will evoke different things. You know, it's, there's the whole emotional level of design, readability issues. So um, in this phase, uh, we really like to experiment a lot with different renderings of the same data to just get a sense of 
what's what seems to feel right for this project right and for the scientific american project in the end we did really simple line charts but we explored a lot of different rendering options um, all of which were super interesting but then were a bit too specific maybe to certain periods or evoke too much of a specific time maybe so we ended up doing like just simple line charts but then we said okay if it's simple line charts they better be looking damn good and so we put a lot of detail polish and little design you know tweaks into something like this little uh, or the simple known chart form to make it shine really well so really think about the color scales different layers of the graphic and just lots of subtle tweaks that make even the the simple line chart something special right um yeah and this all this detail tweaking um i think it's best if you do it not directly like or not too early so it's really good if things look pretty raw in the beginning um but yeah to complete this design phase you want to also want to have a sense of that final look and feel um Here's a few more examples, like left-hand side is in peak spotting the prototype map from the discovery phase, just seeing, hey, how would an animated look, map look like? And then we decide to go for it and really flesh it out. And then on the right-hand side, you see how the, the finished product looks like and you know what, what other layers we brought in to help people find their way around. But just from a functional level, it's pretty much identical to the left-hand side, right? Um, Again, other projects, you can see already like the level of abstraction that's more in a sketch or in a conceptual design idea and then towards the finished product. So there's a lot uh, you can polish uh, if you want <laughs> and really go in depth in, in refining your graphics. Um, quick word about mockups. So um, I, I'm really not a big fan of mocking up data graphics and and I see so many of these line charts you know on dribble or in other design sites and I cannot immediately tell this is not a real data set right because real data is just much more messy it's always the same and I think it's sort of you you're sort of making it like you're basing your design on the assumption that the data will always look super balanced and nice this is not going to play out and it will fall on your feet in the implementation phase right um, and so generally if 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 something says data goes here or chart goes here, I think that's always super problematic. And um, again, my recommendation would be also the refinement here that we talk about, do them on the real thing, like on real data, and not just do a mock-up and say, yeah, we add this type of visual effect and then everything will Probably you know that, just wanted to make sure uh, <laughs> I mentioned that point. Um, th there's a great paper, by the way, on especially this, handover between designers and developers and all these sort of things where a good looking design that looks totally fine on a screen might break when you actually have it in an interactive application or if it meets real data and i think it's a great paper uh, we'll link to it later and that that really illustrates well all these different challenges um, that can uh, can occur in data-driven uh, design and of course, you want to have a good UI design, so um, get your like grids right and all the, the you know the paddings and the margins, nice icons and so on. That that can also play a big role. Uh, often we are so focused just on the chart design and forget sort of about the help button, or <laughs> you know uh, that there should be a consistent like maybe theme or selection mode to the whole application. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned before, the final design deliverable is really a prototype. So it's web-based code, fully interactive. We cut a few corners always. So it's always a bit like dodging the really hard questions. So we leave that for the implementation phase. Um, and that can be deceptive because it looks almost finished, you know, but then you basically have to rebuild it still for the actual produced piece. But it's still so necessary, I think, to demonstrate that the thing you're building feels good and it does actually deliver actual insights. Like you're not simulating, oh, imagine this line chart would show something interesting, but in that prototype, your line chart should already show something interesting. And if it doesn't, it's not finished. So I think that's that's the key point in many projects. How does this prototype work and, and does it live up to the, like, the expectations of how the final product should at least to 80% uh, look and feel like and work like, right? 
And often that is actually the design spec. So we have this interactive prototype, maybe add some annotations like about the things that are different or that are missing. Uh, but it runs in the browser. It uses a few tricks to look more real than it actually is. It works on static data, so we don't use a complicated database or APIs, but just data dumps. So we again, we cut a few corners, but it, the goal is to really give a clear idea of how the final product looks like. Um, in the pig spotting project, we actually had a few prototype iterations, so that was a bit unique or luxurious. So this was the first one that uses still a few tricks, and the charts don't look great here in the middle. Um, and yeah, everything's still a bit clunky, but it, it does look or, already like, yeah, almost an application you could use, but we've refined that even further. And this final prototype is actually, from the initial glance, actually quite close to the production version that, that yeah, was later built and is now running already for three years and has been developed much further and refined. But you can see already like the basic, like DNA, visual DNA of the project very clearly in that final, um, uh, prototype that we handed over. Uh, fun thing with prototypes is also you can give it to other people and see how they use it. And so we, we tend to do that as well, like have a few users just, you know, give them tasks, like find the trains with the highest loads on Tuesday or something like this. And then like watch these videos, like screen recordings. And you can also even do a visualization of these screen recordings to see how much time have people people spent in a certain section of the application or with a certain filter setting, right? And this application was very easy to see because everything changed color. So we could easily see, oh, now he's in the blue section or the red one. And that real, really helped us a great deal to understand which parts of the interface were accessible to people, which parts not so much, where folks had a long time figuring things out, what worked immediately and, and so on. And honestly, it's quite humbling to see people <laughs> use your application in so many things where you think like, yeah, that's obvious, or like, of course it works like this. It will not be that obvious to other people. And I think we have all learned a lot just from user feedback and user tracking on, on these projects. Um, yeah, final phase prototype is produced, um, can now go into production. Um, can't really super talk super much about it. Often I'm also like sort of fading out of the project slowly in that phase. I'm still around. It's important to be around and and keep um, deciding and tweaking and and um, and changing something here and there. Um, but yeah, real development should happen by real developers maybe. Um, but some of the things I think we always keep coming back to the process is it's really good to build like the minimum viable product first, like what's the, the simplest thing we could go online with or that we could publish and that would already work in principle because if you have that, you're A, on the safe side, you cannot fail anymore, and B, you understand what's this like backbone that and now then you can think about, okay, where can we add stuff and how, where does it make sense to now really go into detail, but you have the basics together and there are no more unknowns, right? You also want to freeze adding stuff right well before the final launch, like not just a few days, but actually like weeks. So you have enough time for testing, for tweaking, for refinishing and refining and polishing. And anything you add could sort of throw the balance off, be it in the code or be it in the design. So th there should be a clear point where after that you don't add anything. That's a good rule. Um, good software always needs many iterations. You'll never get it right on the first try. So just plan with having more of these cycles, you know? And uh, yeah, as I said, like you always need to plan with a lot of time for just this final stretch where you think, oh, this looks pretty good already. And then these last 20% kick in really hard and become the second 80. And uh, that's sort of unavoidable. So why not plan with it uh, straight, straight away, right? And some of the things we keep notoriously forgetting is like adding help contents, thinking about promotional material, technical documentation, and so on. And you don't want to do all this last minute, right? So why, why not start early? Oh, yeah. Anyways, then you launch, you're done, moving on. Um, not quite, actually, you can still learn a lot from a f like finished product. And in the peak spotting project, we learned a lot from, again, tracking users. And uh, we even wrote a little like backend visualization of the user session. So that's now very nerdy, I, I admit. 
and maybe a bit over the top. But in fact, we learned a lot by seeing, okay, what's the sequence of steps people took in the application? And for instance, very concretely, you see these little black dots here. So that's one user, and we have many of these that basically only use the search, right? And we have all these amazing data visualizations, you know, with all these filter options and the cool visuals. But <laughs> a big part of our users just uses the search. And, and we were like, OK, wow. OK, so maybe th they would need a totally different tool. And so we said, OK, let's, let's build a dedicated tool for them that uh, this, handles the search case really well, right? And we wouldn't have had this idea at all if we hadn't seen that so many of our users really rely on just a small part of the application. And, you know, basically all their information needs are met with just a fraction of the initial crazy visualization features that we have built. So yeah, these are all the things you can learn <laughs> just by really observing closely how people actually use the things you built. Phew, so we went through a lot of stuff. Um, I hope you're still with me. Uh, just wrapping up, the, I think the key points and also what differentiates this process from more traditional design processes, let's say data visualization design versus interaction design or graphic design or whatever, um, I think you need to be data-driven and user-centric like from the beginning of the project and throughout the whole project. So otherwise, it just doesn't work. Um, uh, I like to call this also a holistic view on data interactions, like not just thinking, OK, um, for this hierarchical data set, is a bubble graph better or a tree map, but really thinking about why do people uh, want to see this application or use it? What would they use it for? With whom, you know? Um, and then the how is often maybe not that important anymore. Or often it really falls right from the tree if you understand all the rest really well. And the other interesting part is really, I think that if you are really skilled with data visualization, um, you can use it as basically a bootstrapping tool along the whole pro project cycle, right? And so we have this universal skill, so we can use it to describe our applications, as you have seen, to analyze user feedback or to analyze user behavior. And that makes it really exciting. So you can visualize your visualization, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah, wrapping up uh, a bit over time, is a big version of that process, still working on it, like that it actually is a, in a good design. And that's the one I like to share with my clients. But again, it's basically just summing up what you have seen in this presentation. So uh, that was a lot. Uh, I hope you uh, had a bit of like chance to digest all that. And now there's time for your questions and your feedback. And thanks again for your attention. Uh, just a quick plug also for that book, How Do You Design? It's really nice by you, Double D, that contains all the fun uh, process diagrams I showed you at the beginning. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was really great and uh, insightful, even totally for me. And uh, before we add the first main question, I want to answer myself to one because there was somebody mentioning why do all designers drag, dress all black? <laughs> and uh, I am a designer. <laughs> I am. This not is great. <laughs> you just don't see it. It's actually great. <laughs> but it's a bit of a true fact, so <laughs> a yeah. lot of time. So, but uh, we want to move towards the first question. Um, it's from Beatrice, and it's a long one. So I will read the first part, and then we'll show the last part. Sure. It's when the project is a tool that once deployed will receive a stream of new live data. It might mm -hmm. happen that the new data has different patterns from the sample of real data used for prototyping. Yeah. And the question there is, how do you create a design that can scale for Zeus unforeseen scenarios? Yeah, great question. Um, generally, like the less you know about the data, the more generic you need to be in your design. Let's say, so if you know, oh, it's just going to be a series of values over time, right? Then your only chance is, OK, let's make a line chart that has like a dynamic you know, vertical axis. And you know, I can't do much more like focused than that. But even then, you could have crazy outliers and so on. And so uh, I think the answer is, on the one hand, try and get a good sample of data beforehand. Like, let's say you know the project is running, uh, or the data stream is maybe already running. Try and get a few weeks of data to really get a 
is the variability of that data set and what are all the unforeseen things that could happen. And other than that, sometimes you have no other chance than really being on the ball and understanding that if things break, you have a way to sort of counteract quickly or try and anticipate some of the typical like problems, maybe add a maximum to the scale. And after that, it sort of breaks, you know, you add these little wiggly lines that say, yeah, it's actually much higher, but we don't show it here. Um, but I think it's really important to, like I don't start projects where we don't have a good a good sample data set, like especially these ones where you would mm. visualize live data. Uh, we had a fun project for the Olympics uh, in London 2012, like uh, the Summer Olympics, mm -hmm. and we milled uh, like together with Studio Nand again, like a data artwork that it was a physical piece, and we had to start milling it before the games would end, and we never knew how to you know how to make the scales because the, and and we there we couldn't go back and fix it, and we were. If I remember correctly, we were lucky and we sort of never exceeded the maximum that we thought it would be, but it was sort of tricky. <laughs> yeah, cool. but generally try and really get a, a sample of the data. Otherwise, it is very hard uh, to, to deal with all the unknowns that, that could happen. Okay. So we have now a question from George Camões. Um, is there anything that you learn or beca became uh, more aware over the last six months regarding data quality outliers and extreme ranges, etc.? Yeah, so uh, I assume you're referring to like COVID data. If, if you talk about the last six months, maybe. Yeah, could be. probably. Um, I would say yes. And yeah, that was very educational in, in many ways. I mean, I think what we all learned is that it's so hard to understand what the right perspectives on certain numbers are. And like, for instance, like, do you normalize per capita or not? That's actually, you know, it's, it's really a complicated debate, you know, when you should report country numbers as total or as per capita. And it's really like quite nuanced. And, and, and I thought that would be much more straightforward. <laughs> and also, you, we all got, I think, a much better sense of how much complicated processes are behind generating data and that it mm -hmm. could lag behind or it's funny on monday we have three times the number of cases and then everybody realizes yeah it's because on the weekends nothing is reported you know and and you suddenly you see all these like the the grittiness of data in in, in this really really apparent form so i think it was very educational in terms of yeah understanding how 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 hard it is to measure such a, a complex real world phenomenon, even with such clear, you know, cases like, oh, somebody's sick or diseased or recovered, you know, it seems like a very simple thing to measure. And even there, you have all this complicated nuance and confusion. And now think about all the data sets you have been working with in the past and where you assumed, yeah, somebody knew, you know, what they were doing and how to measure that thing. And now you can sort of assume it was maybe as complex as all this COVID data that now we all try to understand in depth. Great. Perfect. Uh, We're, ah, here we have, uh, I just edit and we will read it. We have one from Niels who asks, how powerful do you think simple descriptive statistics are in our uh, machine learning methods like clustering often necessary at all? Are they often too complex for end users? That's a great question. So I think there's two questions. So the one thing is, do you think like simple descriptive statistics are often enough? So I think the, the general philosophy in data visualization is to show descriptive statistics, but also show how they come about. So you would not just show the average, but also the distribution, right? You can sort of put the emphasis on the average if that helps people quickly see the trend. But I think that the data viz like way of life is to also show the dots behind it, basically, and and be aware that any like summary statistics might might be misleading, right? And so, but then if you do simple statistics plus show like granularity of the data and sort of the the numbers behind it or the phenomenon behind it, um, I think you're absolutely right. Then often you don't need all the fancy methods that we all love so much. So I. 
I have a few like favorite algorithms and I try to squeeze them in, in any project, you know, <laughs> where I can fit them in. But so often it turns out, ah, it's just one step too much. It's like the nerds will appreciate it, you know, or like the in crew, but no real people actually <laughs> appreciate having to bend their mind so much to actually just get a simple piece of information. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm by now leaning often towards, well, if there's a straightforward question answer thing we can do, let's go for it, you know, and okay. so <laughs> keep provide, it depth, to like provide depth, like as ah. a second step, but optionally, okay. but make sure you have a clear, clear cut answer that people can see, you know. Mm. It can be good. <laughs> yeah, it can be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Pro tip. Yeah. And, and, and therefore, it's a, a nice question we just got. Uh, it was actually one I wanted to ask you myself because I really loved when you mentioned that uh, we should work with real data and mm. uh, doubt the data and all the data failures. So the question from her oh, yeah. is, uh, Moritz, what was your first experience, biggest mistake regarding the design process? <laughs> There's too many to count. Really, <laughs> no, really, when I go through my project folder, like, you know, I have this big project folder with all the projects I did. And I just count like, oh, yeah, this one was, oh, that was a disaster. Like, oh, that was bad. Oh, what did we do here? You know, it's definitely a third of our projects have a fundamental, like, you know, problem. And sometimes there's a point where just things go wrong. It could be on a personal oh. level. It could be you paint yourself into a corner in some way and you can't, or you can't dig yourself out of that hole that you're in. Um, and so uh, it, it's kind of hard to say, but so I made a few really big blunders in not checking if my visualization actually shows the right thing. Mm. And so some visualizations that were really widely shared and <laughs> widely <laughs> circulated, like a week after launch, I realized, oh shit, you know, I totally messed up that data set. And I sort of fixed it. And sometimes I notified people, you know, and sometimes I just, you know, silently fixed it. And so that sort of taught me to always do final like spot checking of take one point in the data, like in the raw data, and follow it through the whole application, and see if it comes yeah. out right at the end, right? And do that for many of them. <laughs> Just to, yeah, because it's so easy to flip like a plus mm. into a minus or to lose a data point along the way. And you get blind to that uh, because yeah. you're so focused on making this gradient of the line chart really look good that, you know, you sort of lose sight of that easily. And so it's good to, to plan that in and also to like maybe have other people do fact checking on your, on your stuff. Yeah, sounds a bit yeah. like getting a tattoo. Maybe our really check it before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and with print projects, it's like that, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Go to Ooh, the for the Scientific or... American project, after it went ah. into print, we thought yeah. for a second we had a huge mistake. We didn't. But th there was, like, for a few, like, you know, hours, there was the option in the room that we might have done something yeah. really wrong. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> it's printed already, and so it's and not just digital. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Awesome. Okay, we we have another one, big one here. Uh, what about the cases when data available from client is not sufficient to solve the problem? Is it the res responsibility of data viz team to dig it up from the potential mm -hmm. sources, or how to otherwise deal with it? That's a great question. And first of all, again, it's really important to find that out early, like not in the implementation phase, you know? So that's why we do the discovery and really realize that very early on, because then you still have a chance to deal with it. And I think it really depends on your project setup. If it's better for you to start, you know, like acquiring data sources um, that fix the problem or the client. In general, if the client is capable of doing it, that would be my preferred solution because it's good if like the, the responsibility for the content, you know, or the data is within the client. And also like that's where like there might also be license fees attached to that or, you mm -hmm. know, some usage restrictions or whatever legal issues. Um, so it can be quite complex to in a professional or like enterprise setting, you know, to actually make use of data, like with all the possible things that com might come with it. So. I, I might consult the client, uh, but would prefer if the client is ultimately responsible for supplying the data. And, and yeah, I think that's often a wise decision. 
but it really depends on your team setup or we might even bring in like additional partners to then take care of that part. Okay. 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 I personally have one question. Uh, so um, going for a more academic view, um, sometimes we have researchers, very creative researchers, especially the ones that we deal with genetic data. Uh, and some, and from time to time, we see some paper, papers published with a very creative visualization that is super difficult to understand. Uh, of course, even for the, the ones that deal with the data on a daily basis and mm -hmm. especially for the outsiders. Yeah. Um, I had this discussion briefly, uh, briefly um, a few days ago, uh, and should we avoid them to publish? What I mean is, of course, they go to peer reviews, but uh, but in the end, they are evaluating the con the scientific co scientific content, not the visualizations uh, themselves. So, it's what uh, what's your, your idea about this? Yeah, I think it, it boils down again to the, you know, the, the what and for whom and, and why and so on. So, um, first of all, I love this phenomenon that different scientific fields have their own like graphics, you know, it's a bit like languages or dialects or like, yeah. you know, you come to this island and suddenly they all do these crazy charts. You yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> I love that yeah. ethnographic aspect of it. And Martin Lambrecht has a site called xeno.graphics, mm -hmm. X-E-N-O. And so there he collects all these really weird yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's a good yeah. source of material yeah, for right. those websites. Yeah. And so I, I think that's totally justified if, if a certain scientific scene has found like a unique way of, of representing a specific data set. The question is, does that become exclusive at some point? Like, do you have to be in the club, you know, to even yeah. understand what's going on? And then it would sometimes be nicer if there would also be a more simple or more straightforward or more generally known alternative. Um, maybe it could also show more high level, like summary of the results, right? And mm -hmm. like all the people who actually work with the data um, could have the detailed graphic. And I think in scientific papers, often there's the case that people just publish the most advanced or the last exploratory graphic they did, mm -hmm. right? And other researchers will appreciate that because that's the same graphic they would have used for data exploration. Yeah. Uh, often there could be maybe more effective communicative graphics if somebody external would take now that same thing and think mm -hmm. about, let's say, if your audience were beyond the in crowd of 10 other people who work on that fly um, <laughs> worldwide. Yeah. Um, how, how would we then present it, right? And, and then often you could do something maybe simpler or more straightforward or more widely understood at least. But mm -hmm. I really don't want to take all these, these crazy graphics away from people. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK, thanks. Nice. I have uh, also one more or less, because there was even a kind of question coming at like that, uh, asking if you even do dashboards. And my question is even, what do you think about dashboards? Ooh. <laughs> you need a whole other hour, I think, about that. <laughs> yeah. And then, to me, it's a bit like storytelling. It's like there's something to it, you know? And there's definitely, like, there's a big value in it in principle. But then the term is so overused. And mm -hmm. it has become its own, like, sort of, caricature in a way, you know, or mm -hmm. so many people mean so many different things from it that it's yeah. almost a meaningless term. And in general, I think it's kind of funny that we need this super steampunky metaphor of gorges and dials, you know, going up and down that we make sense of data. I think humans are more awesome than that and they can read more complex stuff. That's, that's my personal theory. Yeah. And so... I, I try not to fall into too many dashboard cliches. Yeah, um, I just think about what you mentioned about the it makes sense to just show five numbers and show how they change over time. You know, yeah. I, I don't think the old genre, uh -huh. of, like the media format, you know, or the, the application type makes sense, but the may, maybe the whole visual jargon around, me is, uh, around them is just too much for me. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 
Yeah, and it's an ongoing question from people in our meetup, like what tool should I use? Uh, is R and Python better than Tableau or yeah. all these ongoing questions, why do I like do I use a ready-made uh, dashboards, just yeah. put numbers, or when do I but, start? But honestly, so many, and that's again this case where somebody's boss says we need a dashboard for that mm -hmm. because they have in mind we want to solve that business problem. But if you mm -hmm. then go back and say, like, what's the actual underlying business mm -hmm. problem? Maybe a newsletter would be fine. Maybe a monthly meeting would be fine. Maybe a PowerPoint would be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, as a, and so often there's like just the default. Yeah, we need a dashboard for that. But people maybe don't have the imagination that there's something much more like lo-fi or something more, mm -hmm. more. I don't. Or maybe even more advanced would be helpful. And so I think really going back to what what do you want to achieve will help you figure out if it should actually be a dashboard. Mm -hmm. And one gotcha often is the projects is then often just called the the sales dashboard, you know, and you have no other chance because if it's called the sales dashboard, but you make it a newsletter, you know, it's sort of a fail. But then, mm -hmm. yeah. good point. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, really great. So to use your own words and asking when are we done? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would say it was awesome. Really, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, for, thanks for having me. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, and for the insight, and uh, yeah, we didn't came to the point really to discuss your process you shared. For me, it would be really interesting to have a closer look into it. I, as a designer, and you know, from University of Potsdam, uh, they also like to share all the kind of processes. Exactly. <laughs> and now uh, it would be nice to look into it. So maybe I can give you some feedback. Cool. And everybody else, I think, just writes your Twitter email. Or whatever. Exactly. Twitter is the easiest way. So if you have mm -hmm. any follow up questions or your question wasn't answered, you know, yet. So just ping me on Twitter and I'll I'll have an eye on that and point you to the right stuff, hopefully. Awesome. Super. Cool. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank Shall you. Thank you. So bye bye. See you in Lisbon, maybe. Yeah. One day. Sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We will have one more announcement. Thanks, Moritz. Um, yeah, so the one more announcement here, or ah, it was me. So, <laughs> okay. oh, so much to dig in because uh, we just want to share you already um, who's coming next. And it actually fits really well for one answer or once something more it's just mentioned because of their hard way of collecting data and sorting them, for example, the COVID data. And our next guest will be Amanda McCulloch. And she gave a nice talk. I just watched at the Data Festival. And we were super happy to have her. And she will like share some good stuff with you. <laughs> and we're looking forward to see you online again at the 14th meetup at the 14th October. And with, yes, yes. And we didn't know who, what is, uh, who is she and what's their data visualization society. She is the operations director of Look It Up and we will share some insights. It's mandatory. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so so thanks for watching everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Yes. Anytime. See you next time. Bye bye.